I bumped into someone recently who I hadn't seen for some years. They said to me, you haven't changed a bit, except you used to have black hair. <laughs> well, I jumped in very quickly and said, so good to see you again, before they had a chance to offer any more accepts. You know, the compliment itself, you haven't changed a bit, really tells you you're no longer a kid. Well, if I look out at you today, this beautiful gathering of our Oheb Shalom family, and the truth is, you do look beautiful, and say, look at you. You haven't changed a bit. It may not be such a compliment. It may not be such a compliment in the context of our work today. These days of awe invite us to make needed changes, to think in new ways, to improve our behavior, to become more and better than we have been, to not just recycle the years one more time. This past year, I find myself repeatedly returning to this topic of change. During Hanukkah, this past Hanukkah, we took out two Torahs as we do today. That Shabbat, I spoke about dueling Torahs. Dueling Torahs, one Torah representing our need to preserve our past and protect our present into the future, as did the Maccabees against those who sought to destroy us and one Torah representing Judaism's ability to change and speak anew to succeeding generations. It is not only Judaism's ability to change. Judaism demands change. In our prayers we say, Litakein olam, to repair the world, tikkun olam, our mandate as Jews is not to accept the world as it is, but to repair the world, to improve the world, to change the world for the better. We are heirs to a heritage that summons us to pursue justice. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. Justice, justice shall you pursue. When you encounter injustice, seek and pursue what is just. Change it. That Shabbat of Hanukkah came just after the week of the tragic shootings in Newtown, Connecticut. That Shabbat morning, I called for changes in our gun laws for sane laws that will protect our children when they go to school, and adults when we go to the movie theater. It is so clear to all of us that the First Amendment was not passed in Philadelphia to permit someone to shout fire in a crowded theater, and the Second Amendment wasn't passed by those brilliant minds in Philadelphia to permit a madman to walk into that theater or a school with an automatic gun about which they knew nothing in the late 18th century and mow down, mow down innocent lives. There was great emotion in the country at that time. But sadly, as is so often the case, the emotion dissipates though those families, not that many miles north of us, along with other families who have lost their children and loved ones west of us and south of us and north of us, they are still in the throes of their grief. And the gun lobbies, they lobby harder. And nothing has changed. Sadly, 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 we have not changed. This past year, someone to whom I feel very close for a number of years, came to my study grappling with a personal 
and a family issue. The circumstances that he came to talk about called out to him for change, but he couldn't or he wouldn't. One sentence in particular reverberates within me again and again and again, and so I talk about change again and again this year. He said, if I change my position now, I won't be true to all that I have believed throughout my life. If I change now, I will not be able to respect myself. And I am sensitive to this statement. And I empathize with the struggle. Sometimes we must maintain our principles in spite of the pressures of the world changing around us. But sometimes it is our ability to see and understand the world differently and make certain necessary changes that is really what is most deserving of our respect of ourselves and from others. And I tried during that time to make that point. I look at myself and I know that my whole Jewish life is based on change. I made a commitment to keeping kosher when I was in the 10th grade. I won't even begin to tell you what I ate before then. <laughs> but I'll tell you that it comes under the category of glot treif. <laughs> and I also wouldn't be true to you if I didn't tell you I love the taste. <laughs> but I came to love something more deeply and more dearly. I loved even more a serious commitment to Judaism. And there I was, 15, 16, and I changed. We can become what we have not been. That is the meaning of these days. We can support ideas we once rejected or reject ideas we once supported. We can think in new ways and arrive at new conclusions. We don't have to be exactly who and how we have been. We can change. This past April, Sunday morning, one of the greatest events in the synagogue this past year, we had a sisterhood breakfast honoring Sandy Blumenthal in support of Women's League Torah Fund, which supports the work of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York and other rabbinical schools of our movement in Los Angeles, Buenos Aires, and Jerusalem. We had as our guest speaker a second year rabbinical student at JTS by the name of Bronwyn Mullen, not a typical rabbinic name. So when I walked into the social hall that morning, people were milling around and I was looking for our guest speaker to welcome her. She wouldn't be hard to pick out. I can tell a rabbinical student from a mile away. It's kind of like rabbinic profiling. Uh, I, of course, recognized everyone in the room, but there were two women I assumed were, for some reason, guests. One was a woman with long gray hair, and the other was a young woman who looked like she just came off of an off-Broadway play. She had a stud in her nose and sort of a bohemian flair to her dress. She looked like anything but a rabbinical student. She was our rabbinical student from JTS. And I was happy that she and I had an opportunity to chat before the program began. As she told me, our guest had a dream of going into the theater. In her mesmerizing presentation that morning to the group, she was as good as a one-woman show on Broadway 
telling the story of her life. She told us how she was co-teaching a class, a high school class, Hebrew high school, at B'nai Jeshurun in New York City, one of the great synagogues in the country. And a student asked the two teachers, co-teachers, something about their personal life. So there was Bronwyn Mullen, and there was a co-teacher, an Orthodox woman wearing a shaitel. You know what a shaitel is? Or really Orthodox women, if you get far enough into the world, they don't show their own hair. Some cover their whole head with a hat, a scarf, and then even farther in, they wear a wig, a shaitel. Wigs are very big in the Orthodox world. Well, it was so interesting that this Orthodox woman was on the faculty of the foremost progressive conservative synagogue in the country, BJ in New York City. After much soul searching, Bronwyn told the class, in response to the question, that she is gay. So she knew it wasn't going to be a big deal for the students because in this very progressive conservative synagogue that has a long history of acceptance and support of the LGBT community. But her concern was being rejected by her orthodox colleague. So the class happened. She was very nervous. And after the class, she and her colleague were alone. And her colleague's words to her were, Bronwyn, why have you had to keep this a secret? Why didn't you tell me before? And she embraced her. She embraced her as a colleague. She embraced her as a Jew. She embraced her as a friend. Now, I have to imagine that something dramatically had changed in this orthodox woman wearing the shaitel that she could on that day be as accepting as she was of her colleague. She couldn't always have thought this way. She had to change. And so interestingly, what did the Orthodox colleague do? You know, the gay stuff was kind of like peripheral. But she saw deeper inside of her that this was a potentially great student of Judaism. And she, she encouraged her to go to one of the progressive yeshivas on the Upper West Side and to study Jewish texts seriously. And Bronwyn did that, and she loved it. And it made her possible, after studying for two and a half years, to apply to rabbinical school at JTS. And she was accepted. Her co-teacher embraced her and had clearly embraced change in her own life. She changed. She is seeking justice. She is personally repairing the world. Something dramatic, something so very dramatic has changed at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Our conservative seminary in New York City. I think we have all learned the title today, Progressive Conservative Judaism. When I was at the seminary in the early 70s, there were no female rabbinical students and no openly gay candidate would ever be considered for admittance into the rabbinical or cantorial school. I felt so proud of JTS that morning, not only because of sexual orientation, but looking at this young woman with a stud in her nose and bohemian flair to her dress. She in no way fit the mold of the typical rabbinical student. And in meeting her, and I'm sure she's not the only one at JTS today, 
it looks like we will have a new generation of rabbis not so easily profiled and the Jewish world will be immeasurably enriched. In the spring edition of the United Synagogue magazine, I hope you all get it, it's called Kolot. It's getting to be a better and better magazine. We should all receive it as members of a conservative synagogue. There is an article in the spring, it's not the most recent edition, but in the spring edition, an article that tells a wonderful story written by Rabbi Myron Fenster, a distinguished longtime Long Island rabbi entitled, and I love this title, Loving Tradition Enough to Change It. I love that title. Listen to it again. Loving Tradition Enough to Change It. Rabbi Fenster teaches us to love something is not to preserve it exactly as it was and put it in a glass case under lock and key. Because anything that is alive, and Judaism is alive, anything that is alive changes. To love something enough to keep it alive is to be involved in its growth and evolution, its change. So Rabbi Fenster, Myron Fenster, was a member of the Committee of Jewish Law and Standards of the Rabbinical Assembly, which determines halachic policy, issues of Jewish law for our conservative movement. So questions like this are brought to the committee. In the 1950s, uh, can a person drive on Shabbat? In the 1970s, can a woman be counted in a minyan? 1970s, can a woman have an aliyah to the Torah, 1980s. Can a woman be admitted to a rabbinical school? And in the 1990s, the question was raised, can a gay candidate, openly gay candidate, be admitted to rabbinical school? And the answer by the law committee was, after much debate, no. Well, more recently, in the early 21st century, it was asked again. Rabbi Fenster was on the committee. It's a rotating committee. Rabbi Fenster was on the committee at that time. And here he was, a man in his 70s. And he could have hid behind his age. And he could have said, listen, it's too late for me to change now. This is how I believed my whole life. What do you want from me? I, I can't change. It's too late. Because I am sure that at one time, I am sure that at one time, Rabbi Fenster, and maybe not that long ago, that he too had said no. But this time, when the vote came up before, before the law committee, Rabbi Fenster's vote was yes. And the decision of the committee was yes. And the story becomes even sweeter. Rabbi Fenster retired from his large, prestigious pulpit in Roslyn, New York. And is so often the case, the meaning of a rabbi retiring means he takes a smaller pulpit somewhere else. That's less demanding and whatever. And so Rabbi Fenster took a smaller pulpit on the tip of the island. And he stayed there for four or five years. And then he really, really retired. He was succeeded in that pulpit by a recent graduate, had just graduated, a recent graduate of the seminary, who was born in Israel, raised in a conservative, in, a, in an orthodox home, and who showed great promise to have an equally distinguished rabbinic career. He began his studies in the seminary the first year that they admitted openly gay students. It was on that basis that this openly gay candidate was admitted. I love this title. I love this title. Loving tradition enough to change it. If we really love something with all of our heart and all of our soul, we won't leave it as a relic of the past. Like an organism that survives by mutations and adaptations, 
We help the object of our love survive and thrive with change and growth while not abandoning the core. A few years ago, I spoke at Kol Nidre that I was prepared to officiate at a ceremony of two Jewish gay or lesbian individuals in love. But when I said that a few years ago, I also felt that the ceremony that I would perform for that couple would not be the traditional Jewish marriage ceremony. Because I felt that the traditional Jewish marriage ceremony was designed and used for centuries for a traditional Jewish couple, man and a woman. So while I was opening to officiating, I would create some kind of a Jewish kind of light uh, ceremony for that couple. But again, I have changed. Today, if I were invited, and I would be, inv I would be honored to, officiate at the ceremony of two Jewish gay individuals, I would use exactly the same Jewish traditional wedding ceremony that I've used at every wedding up until this time. And as recently as this past Sunday afternoon, as I look at father and mother of the bride, Manny and Marcy, sister, Bubby, Mazel tov. It was it was great. It was a great, very special joy. Uh, Brooke and David. Yeah. Yeah, I would use the very same a ceremony because that couple in love pledging their lives and hearts to each other, they deserve the same ritual as our tradition. Just as I believe every loving gay and lesbian couple should have the right to marry in every state of this great country. I'll tell you something else. I have never in my rabbinic career officiated at a wedding that did not involve also a state license. You know what I mean by that? It was when I officiated a Jewish wedding here in Pennsylvania, uh, I demand that it also be valid by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I say, by the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Moses and Israel, you are now husband and wife. I don't want to do any private Jewish weddings. It is really great we should be so honored and fulfilled that we can perform wedding ceremonies that are recognized by the state. Wasn't always that way. So my policy was either there is a state document or they already, for whatever reason, had a secular ceremony. Sometimes if it was a destination marriage and it's in a place that never heard of a rabbi, uh, that they'll come back for the religious Jewish ceremony. But they can already show me a civil document that is then recognized in the state of Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, other states throughout the country. But I would today, another change. I would officiate at a Jewish religious ceremony today in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania where they do not yet have a civil document because our state is one of the few states in the Northeast today that does not recognize a civil union or a marriage between two gay individuals. I think it's an act of justice. I think it's an act of repairing the world. And as for our state, they will someday soon. It's inevitable and inexorable. It is an issue of pursuing justice and repairing the world. Someone told me a couple of years ago that they were having a conversation on the beach in Margate uh, about what books I would refer to during the High Holy Days. I, I can't tell you how touched I was. <laughs> you know, of all of the wonderful moments you can have lying there on the beach, under the sun, going into the water, just enjoying yourself, the middle of the summer, 
So what book do you think the rabbi will refer to on the High Holy Days this year? OK. One of the most important books on the Jewish scene this past year is Jewish Megatrends, Charting the Course of the American Jewish Future. You may have missed this up until now. <laughs> so that you really hear the title, let me say it again. Jewish Megatrends, Charting the Course of the American Jewish Future. And I feel a personal investment that this book sells well, available by Amazon, <laughs> uh, because this is my brother-in-law Sid's third book. <laughs> so if you ever bump into Sid, please tell him that I talked about his book <laughs> on Rosh Hashanah. Actually, uh, after the holidays, we have a tradition of exchanging sermons. Uh, I send him four sermons, and uh, he sends me one sermon. He's got a great deal. He, uh, he, he's the founding rabbi of uh, the Reconstructionist congregation of Dat Shalom in Bethesda, Maryland. And after nine years, uh, because he uh, became the founding president of an organization called Panim, uh, he, uh, he became the youngest rabbi emeritus in his of, of any congregation in the country. So he preaches only on Yom Kippur. He sends me his one sermon. I send him, so he'll get the sermon. But nevertheless, if you happen to bump into him, just put in a good word. So uh, Sid's book could be subtitled, A Call for Change. In this book, Jewish Mega, Megatrends, Sid is optimistic about the future of the American Jewish community. But only, only, only if we understand that the Judaism of the 21st century is not the same as the Judaism of the 20th century. And we change accordingly. Jewish millennials are different from generation Xers and surely different from us baby boomers. It is a bummer that we boomers invented the idea of the generation gap and in ways it still exists. And now we find ourselves on the wrong side of the generation gap. How did that ever happen? Yeah, because in ways it still exists. But actually, if we get the generations that come after us, if we get them, in a way that the generations who came before us never got us, then there need not be a generation gap. In writing about the generation, Sid writes how we, we were shaped, our Jewishness was shaped by the memory of the Holocaust, the founding in the early years of the State of Israel, Israel's miraculous survival, in 1967, I remember that Monday night so well. We flocked to the synagogue. The synagogue was full. People were running up to the front of the synagogue where I grew up in Temple Shalom, and they've been putting checks made out to the Israel Emergency Fund. Would Israel survive by the end of the week? Little did we know the war would be over with Israel triumphant in six days. That's what shaped our Jewish lives. We had parents or grandparents who came from the old world. And many of us grew up hearing Yiddish. But Sid writes about the millennials. Sid writes, their loyalties are more global and universal. They are interested in the larger world and concerns that affect the larger world, the environment, poverty, social justice, and our path to them is the wisdom Judaism has in regard to these central issues. Sid knows well of what he speaks because he was the founding president and for 20 years president of this organization, Panim, where he brought high school and college kids from around the country to Washington, D.C for a Jewish 
version of the presidential classroom. So year after year, for 20 years, he saw these kids firsthand. He knew what made them think. He knew what their passions were. He knows what their commitments are. And my sister and Sid are parents to this generation who know and care deeply about the world. My nephew Joel spent a year in China teaching English in between college and his master's degree in public policy. My niece Jennifer is now finishing a year in India working on environmental issues. She was in Haiti after the terrible hurricane. My nephew Daniel spent a year and a half in London getting his master's degree from the London School of Economics. Young people today become universal and they care about, they know about the whole world in a way that we never did. My nephews and niece are committed to Judaism and they are committed to the world. I just received this email from my niece Jenny just a couple of days ago. She writes, I'm in Kashmir right now. So many of you have been to Key West. How many have been to Kashmir? <laughs> I better put my hand down. Here's what Jenny writes. I'm in Kashmir right now. I finished my fellowship, extended my visa, and now traveling for five weeks. I know my sister was thrilled to hear this. <laughs> Travels have been so, so great. I'm in the far north, India. I'm leaving on a hiking trek this afternoon for one week. I hope she didn't send this to my sister also. <laughs> so I wanted to wish you a Shana Tova Umetuka before I left. Hope your holiday sermons are all ready with that little smile, you know, on the side. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Send love and regards to Janie. Love, Jenny. Sid's opening sentence in his book, did I tell you the title, Jewish Megatrends? <laughs> charting the course of the American Jewish future. His opening sentence is, the Jewish community is in a time of transition. Synagogues are losing numbers. Thank God we are here in such large and glorious numbers again this year. But synagogues are losing numbers. The number of donors to federations, you won't believe this. The number of donors to federations has gone down 50% in the last generation. One generation. It is staggering. And so we can do the same old, the same old, and just watch the ongoing erosion, or we can commit ourselves to change. We need to transition, as Sid describes it, from synagogue centers that work top down, where only the clergy and staff provide all of the programming, and members of the congregation are consumers. That was the old synagogue center to what he calls synagogue communities. And I think that in many areas, we have been here at Oiv Shalom ahead of the curve things that are being talked about as new innovations, many we have adopted. Synagogue communities, it's not only a building with members. We are a community, a synagogue community. And I don't know that I should read this out loud, but Sid also writes, and rabbis need to change. He writes like this, the synagogue community requires rabbis to adopt a very different leadership style than they had been trained for. Rabbis must move from talk control mode to listen empower mode. So my job is not to tell you which I hope I had never seen that as my mission to tell. To, but my job is to inspire for us to be doing this together as a community. 
In synagogue communities, Sid writes, the emphasis shifts from an obsession with membership, the number of membership, the number of members matters most, to ownership, Jews who see themselves on a journey toward more engaged Jewish living. We need our members, we need you, and we need more. But it's not about how many new members we have today. It's about how many new relationships that I spoke about last year on this day. How many new relationships are formed within our community. And the relationship that we each develop with each other and with Judaism. Relationships are at the core of the Jewish community. The most recent edition, I hope you saw this also, the most recent, recent edition of Kolot, Voices of Conservative Masorti Judaism, is devoted to, do you see the front page of it, even if you didn't have a chance to open the front cover? How can synagogues evolve? That's what we're all talking about. How can we not stagnate and just do the same old, the same old? How can we evolve? I'm very proud. I am very proud that for the first time this year, under the aegis of our magnificent inclusion, Bikavod, we are live streaming our service to those in our community who cannot be physically present at our service. Over the years, it breaks my heart when someone tells me that because of an ongoing illness, they can't make it, or someone is in the hospital or just returned from the hospital, and they'll say to me, Rabbi, this is the first time in 35 years. I can't make it to the synagogue for Kol Nidra. I can't make it to the synagogue for the Rosh Hashanah service. And I see how broken up they are. I wanted to do something, but I couldn't. But then I learned that we can. We can use the best of modern technology in a sacred way. And we can bring our service to them. That's why we did it. But you know, equally exciting, listen to this, any person anywhere in the world with a Wi-Fi hookup can be with us right now. Jews who live in an area where there isn't a synagogue for hundreds and thousands of miles, they might have been told from one of our members that they can follow our service, and I wouldn't be surprised. I have gotten responses from my Devar Torahs that I've sent out by email from Australia because someone in the congregation sent it to a relative in Australia. It is amazing what we can do in the world today. Look, we know that we want to be here, but for those who can't be here, maybe someone who hasn't walked into a synagogue for the last 25, 30 years isn't ready to walk in today. But when they heard that they could follow the service on their iPad or their, their computer, maybe they're with us today. You know, it used to be that the relationship between the synagogue and a congregant formally started, or the synagogue and a Jew formally started, when a check was made out and we said, now you are a member. We have learned it's different today. We have to build relationships first. And when you really do build a relationship, when you really do build that relationship, the membership check will come. And if it's really a relationship, if you really made a relationship, and that person really cares about the synagogue, then voluntary donations more and more even continue beyond it. It's not about just having a member. It's about having a relationship with that person before they join and after they join. It's about relationships. So for those who are watching our service today uh, by our live stream, I want to say a very, per very special and personal welcome. And what I'd like to invite you to do is to just send me a note, an email, that you were part of our service. And you can send this email to rabbi at ohev.org. 
You can all send an email also. It's, uh, <laughs> tell me anything. Rabbi at Ohev.org. And if you're watching this by live stream, tell me where you are seeing this and how it worked for you. You might make other changes for next year. We are evolving. Look, our service is being signed by Brandy Lerner. Brandy, how do you sign Brandy Lerner? It's like this, right? <laughs> does, that, does that work? Like, by, right. You know what, I've seen signers at college graduations, high school graduations, important speeches. But you know, there are people in our community who, some who don't hear well, and so know that we have devices, they always sit over here. I'm glad to see there are none here because they're all being used where you plug in and the sound is amplified uh, so that you can hear every melody and every word. And we have those who can't hear. But today they can hear because of Brandy. We are evolving. No one should feel excluded. And there are still more and more ways that we can reach out. Tuesday morning, two days ago, you can imagine how busy we were in the synagogue. Paula and I were sitting in my office uh, going over last minute things for the service today. Someone knocked on my door and she came in and she said, Rabbi, I know you're busy. I'd like to tell you something. Uh, she and I, this person and I, had spoken some months ago about her family dilemma. And I very gently recommended a path for her to take. And at the time, she told me, Rabbi, absolutely, I can't go there. And she told me all the reasons why. It's never going to happen. So we saw each other periodically throughout the year. She would tell me about small steps that she was taking. And each time she told me, I told her how proud I was of her, which was followed by a loving hug. And Tuesday morning, she had to come in before the new year began and tell me, Rabbi, I have done a total 180. And she told me with such a big smile on her face. And she looked so very proud because she did something that's not so easy. She changed. And dear friends, we can too. And so this morning, I invite you to think about the most important change you need to make. Today you might say, today you might say there's no way. And you may well find the way. The dueling Torahs. Sometimes we need to preserve the past and the present for the future. And other times we need to make changes. The brilliance of Judaism has been its ability to do both. It can be a matter of justice. It can be a matter of repairing our broken world. One of the places where some of the greatest change happens is in what is known as the 12-step programs. AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, NA, Narcotics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous. 12-step programs is a place where life-saving changes happen from addiction to life-affirming sobriety. They recite a beautiful prayer composed by the great theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, which has come to be known as the serenity prayer. And so, as I invite you to have a year of change when necessary, preserving life when most needed, I conclude with this blessing for each one of us. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom, the wisdom 
to know the difference. Amen.